Good day and welcome to the Big Ideas Theater here at the AARC Congress. I'm Ed Hyland. Got a special guest to really get things going. Uh, Dr. Zubin Tamanya, thank you so much for coming to buy. Better known as Z-Dog to all of his fans. What up, I tell fam? you. You are amazing, first of all. The keynote was spectacular, packed house. But we want to talk just first about the character, the person. Not a character, it's a, it's a, huge, it's a huge person here. And I want to talk a little bit about the following that you've got. I mean, since Z-Dog, you walk here in Mandalay Bay and there's people, hey Z-Dog, what's going on? You got, you got the Z-Pack, you got folks who are following you. how the character come about and how does it relate? Why are you able to relate so closely to what's going on with respiratory therapists? You know, you give them five bucks, they will scream for you. That's the thing. I find bribery to be a highly efficient tool to build loyalty. You have your people that just toss my bills people. over your corner. My, yeah. and, and your people have talked to my people about my people. So, well, no, all joking aside, the persona of Z-Dog was created out of a kind of a despair. So it was a sort of a cry for help. I was working at Stanford as a doctor for years, and it was, it was truly a calling to get to be with people when they're so vulnerable and have them open up to you. And I saw that calling slowly start to be destroyed by all the forces that push in. No one's fault, this is just a system that's arisen. And it causes this kind of moral distress in us as frontline healthcare professionals. And respiratory therapists feel it as much as anybody because they're pressured for time, there isn't a sense of collaboration, they're busy clicking boxes in an electronic record now instead of talking. And so as that started to change, I found that I could either continue to become depressed and try to figure out a way to retire, play the lottery a lot, or I could try to regain, regain a voice. And for me, the voice was, let me make some videos. I've always been a little bit of a class clown. I'll make some videos on YouTube, kind of a calling out and satirizing what we go through. And I'll create a character because that way Stanford won't figure out <laughs> that I'm doing this. Of they course, never knew it was you. They never knew it was me, even though my face is right there. And, uh, and, and so, as a result, uh, I got away with murder for a long time making these videos and then grew a following. The next thing you know, I've quit my job, moved to Vegas, started a clinic, did all the other things that came with kind of following what your, what your gut is really telling you is the right thing to do. And you're able to relate to people who have been through the same experiences that you are portraying on the on the video screen as well. Wanted to get into your presentation, talk about healthcare 3.0. Uh, first of all, what happened to point 1.0 and 2.0, and how is 3.0 different? So 1.0 was that cottage industry of healthcare that you remember from the 20th century, which was a doctor and a patient in this sacred relationship. Lots of time. You knew your doctor. You exchanged chickens for medicine. You know, it was a a barter economy and it was a cottage industry and it worked because it was about trust and relationship, the laying of hands. What didn't work was as medicine started to grow and science started to come in and processes started to improve, costs escalated, quality wasn't great because we learned a lot from other industries like, oh, you know, computers can actually help medicine, there are different technologies, evidence-based medicine shows it gets better. So in a response to the failures of 1.0, 2.0 sprung up. 2.0 is like computer-driven algorithms, check boxes, electronic health records, quality science, and these kind of things. But what got lost is many doctors felt like commodities. So now, and patients. So patients felt like, well, the doctor's looking at the computer the whole time. I don't know my doctor anymore. I'm going to Google to find answers and getting misled down a path that, that is not helpful to me. So what has to emerge now when Lots of frontline medical people are being burned out, and it's not really burnout, it's moral distress. We can't practice our calling the way we know it needs to be practiced because of all this uh, overlay on top of it. It's kind of fallen into, so to build 3.0, we repersonalize medicine, we bring back the best aspects of one, which was the human relationship. We empower it with the best aspects of two, which is the technology, the process improvement. But what emerges is something new, collaborative, relationship-driven, incentivized by payment models that actually pay us to do good for patients so we can do well financially. So all the incentives align, and then we have to recondition ourselves to go, you know, this is the way we care for patients. It's not about doing a bunch of tests. It's not about doing a bunch of surgeries. It's about doing the right thing for the unique patient in front of you, using technology to enable that knowledge, but bringing it right back to the human relationship in a collaborative environment. So personalized medicine and making sure that the patient, uh, who has always been number one, is indeed put in the very forefront of how you take care of them. You listen to the patient. That is a key part of 3.0, is listening to the patient, but a piece that we add on is the provider side. 
So if we aren't part of this discourse, and we've been ignored, so people go, it's, it's about patient-centered medicine. That's great, but if you forget about us, we're human beings that have to interact and you don't think about our well-being and our resources and our autonomy and our tools, you will never get the best care for the patient. So it, it throws them back into the mix as an integral part of this relationship. So if you're my patient in 3.0, it's not like 1.0 where I'm like, listen, this is what you're gonna do. There's nothing, you have no other choice. It's not like 2.0 where it's like, here's a bunch of data. Uh, you go ahead and choose what you like and just tell the secretary. 3.0 is, listen, I got to know you, your hopes, dreams, fears, goals. You want to see your grandkid dance in this ballet and you want to be able to breathe off oxygen to do that. Let's come up with a strategy that I know has worked in my experience and I think it'll work for you and based on your genetic testing, I think there's certain personalizations we can do. But then I'm going to email you and text you and call you and I'm going to health coach, help work with you in a team and the respiratory care person's going to help me manage your, your breathing so that you can accomplish your specific goal. Not an arbitrary goal set from on high, because that never works. It has to be a, a, a collaborative, interpretive relationship. And, and, uh, and I, just to put in a, a contradictory point, the issue of, of people telling you what to do, you as a provider, okay, you're allowed 10 minutes with this patient. You know, it's, it's, it's medicine that only has so much time for the patient. Doesn't that limit how much you can really do for and with the patient in terms of the interaction you're talking about? I don't have time for emails. I don't necessarily have time for calls for everybody. So the way you address that is you change the entire structure to focus on actual outcomes and focus on things that matter to patients. So it may be that you don't need to come and see me. It may be that we can have an email or a Skype exchange that will get your question answered efficiently and not book up an appointment. Then I can spend an hour with my COPD patient, the chronic lung disease, with a health coach, with a social worker, coming up with an algorithm. Why are you having so much trouble? You're not able to get around. You don't know how to ride the bus. Maybe we should teach you to ride the bus, and that will give you independence that will lift the depression, that will improve the medication compliance, and the next thing you know, they're better. But it takes caring and time. So to do that, you, you use technology to offload the stuff that can be simpler and quicker. Brilliant and practical approach. Wonderful. Want to take one quick moment before we uh, let you go uh, back to uh, your, your, your Z-Pack here, is uh, talk a little bit about uh, another uh, element of your persona that's out there, Doc Vader. <laughs> it's very dark. It's very dark. It's very hard. Doc Vader came up because he was a doctor who fell to the dark side because every single administrator and MBA was telling him, you must click these boxes and see this many patients. And now he is more machine than man. He is the voice of our frustration. And I tell you, I have I have actually invented something called... He's I, healthcare 2.0. He is, he is a prisoner of 2.0. He's a 1.0 guy that went kicking and screaming into 2.0, became a machine and never transcended it. Now, I have something I call the Doc Vader Index, which is how popular is Doc Vader online? When he's doing really well, because he complains about everything is broken, we're, we're not doing a good job fixing healthcare. My goal is to make Doc Vader obsolete, where people look at him and go, how quaint, what's he complaining about? That's ridiculous, we don't work that way. So that's the ultimate goal, is to transcend Vader, turn him back to the light side, burn him on a funeral pyre and have him be a beautiful force ghost talking to us about how great medicine is. Well, medicine has to be great when you can work in Star Wars references as well as, uh, you know, the great care that we give to our patients. Agreed. <clears throat> z Dog, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great pleasure, and uh, I'll let you get to your, uh, your z pack now. Thanks so much, and have fun while you're in Vegas. I mean, you're, you're a resident. You get to do this all the time, right? All day, every day. z pack for life. Thanks for talking to me. Hey, thank you so much. <laughs> really this is the Big Ideas Theater at AARC Congress.